everyone. This is our systemic review of analyzing effects of sexual education method on teen pregnancy rates. My name is Kara White. I'm here with Riley Jacobson and Elizabeth Uggen, and we're from the Carroll College Nursing Department. Hi guys, um, I'm Elizabeth, but I also go by Libby. So to begin, um, our research question was, in teens aged 13 through 19, does comprehensive sex education versus abstinence-only sex education lower rates of teen pregnancy in the US? So to begin, um, the United States is actually the leader in teen pregnancy when compared to all other developed nations. In recent years, luckily, this number has gone down. Um, and something really interesting about that is we don't know why, but it has gone down, which is something really awesome. Um, in 2017, which is when the, the data was most recently collected, almost 200,000 babies were born to teenage mothers in the United States. Uh, this is kind of important because teen pregnancy and childbearing bring substantial social and economic costs through immediate and long-term impacts on the involved families in the United States as a whole. So for example, $9.4 billion of U.S. public money goes towards various social programs such as WIC, which supports teen parents and their children annually. Um, adolescent pregnancy is associated with lower rates of high school graduation for the mothers, greater, chance, greater chances of living in poverty, and less favorable health outcomes long term for both mother and children. Additionally, children resulting from adolescent pregnancies are more likely to be incarcerated, unemployed, or to become teen parents themselves, which then perpetuates a cycle. Um, teens are especially susceptible to teen pregnancy due to their propensity for risk taking, such as uh, engaging in unprotected sexual intercourse. Um, so because of this, the high, rates of of the high rates of teen pregnancy that exist in the United States come with many social and economic burdens that indicate the need for intervention. Um, we decided to study this just because it's something that we individually have all had a lot of history with um, in that I came from a Catholic school, so I never really learned much about this. Um, you know, Kara and Riley both have had really different, unique experiences, and I used to work for Planned Parenthood, so this is something that we're all really individually passionate about. Um, some additional facts that I can talk about is that what comprehensive sex education is. Um, it's really broad, and there really is no baseline de definition for it, but it includes an emphasis on human rights. It encourages education about diverse forms of birth control, um, including... Uh, IUDs, pills, condoms, basically any type of method that doctors are going to talk to you about, um, as well as natural family planning methods, which is really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, so it's super, super broad. Uh, it also talks about, you know, healthy relationship building, STIs, all of those fun things. And then we're also in here discussing abstinence only, which we'll also call AOUM. Um, this is the most common form of sexual education in the United States, and that's where most of our federal funding goes to. Um, it's defined as sexual education that recommends delaying sexual intercourse in marriage, um, which theoretically would eliminate sexually transmitted infections and unplanned pregnancies. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about our articles right here in bright purple in the middle. Go, Carol. Um, we had a lot of trouble finding those upper level studies like randomized control studies with ethics on this topic and just the nature of those studies. It's really difficult to do that research with these populations. Um, so we had a, a couple level three studies. Those were our highest and then the rest were level six qualitative studies and case reports. So just going right in this first study here is a level three quantitative study. Um, it was specifically in conservative states and talked about the different funding that they had. They found that if AOUM was funded, it was associated with an increase in teen pregnancy in those states, and vice versa, if CSE was funded, it was showing a decrease in teen pregnancy rate. That one was um, the first article that had like the really strong research that we were looking for. Um, and then they found no patterns identified for t those types of sexual education in the more moderate or liberal states. Next, we had a level six qualitative study that uh, focused on faith and religious groups that were discussing the types of sex education that we had and whether or not they had lower rates of teen pregnancy with either one. Um, next, again, we had another level six, this time a case report uh, between 2006 and 2008. So this was our oldest study. However, uh, it fit really, really great with our PICOT question, so we kept it because it gave us some really good research and some really good stuff to talk about in our critical appraisals. This one showed us that 
only two thirds of US citizens have received any form of abstinence education, as well as birth control education before the age of their first time having sex. Um, those who did receive that education in any form were shown to have higher ages of first intercourse and later age in pregnancy. So that one was just a really good one showing that education period is super helpful in um, lowering rates of teen pregnancy. Next, we had another level six qualitative study. This one was an open-ended qualitative questionnaire, specifically in Charleston County, South Carolina. It talked about um, comprehensive sex education, sexual health reproduction, abstinence only education, and kind of what the uh, parents studied wanted out of comprehensive sex education and what they valued the most about it. It did show that the participants did want CSE as the primary prevention method for STDs and teen pregnancy, and that it should be very diverse and include all forms of sex, sex education, reproduction, gender identity, anatomy, consent, a really broad, broad um, idea of what CSE is just to kind of cover all the bases and not just do a blanket statement. Next, we had a level, another level six qualitative study. This one consisted of small group and individual interviews, uh, specifically in African American youth and adults in a very small region in rural North Carolina. So this was kind of a little pull out of the hat uh, random study that we found that worked really well for our PICO question. Unfortunately, this one is not very good to generalize across the board because it is a very small location to a specific population. Um, this region, it was very important to them to do this study because they have very high rates of STDs in teen pregnancy. So it was good for them to get a view of like what the community really wanted out of sex education and how they felt about the sex education being taught currently and how they could make changes to it. Again, in line with the one right above that, participants agreed that they wanted really individualized and diverse CSE over kind of a blanket statement. And they did agree that CSE was the most effective tool for preventing teen pregnancies and STIs. Um, and then they also, in this one, they did specifically talk about who was teaching the CSE, and they thought that not only should schools be teaching it, but also parents at home should be breaching the topic of CSE and kind of doing that. So that, again, opened another kind of ethical thing about um, going back to the faith group article where AOUM was more in the religious groups, um, like whether or not the parents wanted to teach it at home and how that kind of went over. But that was a really interesting article for that specific location. And then finally, we have a level three quantitative study. Again, one of our upper level articles. This was an eight hour evidence-based sex education curriculum that was introduced to middle school students. So it was in two counties in Wisconsin and they found that um, the curriculum had actually reduced the teen birth rates in the counties by um, about 3.4% and uh, got it down to about 2.6% in those counties, uh, coming from about a 5%, which is fairly high for only two small counties in Wisconsin. And then um, this one they documented before and after the introduction of the curriculum to get those rates and just kind of see how it went over, what happened, and just learn a lot from that. So it did uh, lower teen birth rates and then it persisted for another six years after the introduction and maintenance of the program. So that was a really great article to add to our roster here. All right, so some conclusions we gathered from this research. Many of the articles mentioned that as long as teens and young adults have some sort of sexuality education before their first age of intercourse, that that age is likely to be greater and then that their rate of teen pregnancy is lesser. And then when populations are asked which they prefer, the AOUM or the Comprehensive Sexuality Education, those populations prefer CSE. And I think that this information we gathered is particularly impactful because it's from communities that were hit really hard by teen pregnancy. And they're the ones who specifically said in these studies that they would like to see CSE. There are weaknesses to comprehensive sexuality education, and those were identified in the studies. There are various barriers to teaching it. Of course, if you have to get it in schools, that requires funding. Having adults teach it to adolescents means that the adults need to know what they're talking about. 
and there are also some cultural barriers that one might find in the United States preventing CSE from being accepted in schools and other educational formats. Again, the method of teaching these articles emphasize that sexual education happens not only in school but also with parents and even with faith leaders so there's going to be some disparity on how one person gets their sexual education versus another even if it's all under that umbrella of comprehensive sexuality education mm -hmm. and again the information may not be the same from person to person the information that we got, the quantitative, the hard numbers, they were very limited in their scope. For example, the first set of hard numbers was only applicable in conservative U.S. states, as defined by that study, but the moderate and liberal U.S. states, there was absolutely no correlation, no trend of any kind identified, so that can't be applied to the greater U.S. as a whole. And the other study that found hard numbers was in two counties in a Midwestern state. So again, cannot be applied to all of the US as a whole. Nurses are primary educators of patients and they can find many applications with this information. Thank you. Sorry. Nurses can teach their patients more effective sexual education methods as well as pregnancy prevention. So based on this, we know that sexual education of any sort prevents teen pregnancy. And so as a nurse trying to promote health outcomes in your patient population, making sure to give any sort of sexual education is important. Additionally, the nurse in various roles may interact with teen mothers and or their children. And so it's important to have an understanding of factors that lead up to a teen pregnancy, factors that are more common as a result of teen pregnancy, and really understand what your patients are living through and how you can support them best as individuals. Nurses can advocate for their facilities and their organizations to endorse evidence-based practice. So when hard trends are identified, for example, that any sort of sexual education leads to a decreased teen pregnancy, nurses need to speak up about that and educate their patients, their coworkers, and their leaders about that. Finally, providing effective evidence-based sex education to these populations. Again, the nurse's primary role is an educator to their patients. And it's important that the education we provide is supported by evidence. It's developmentally appropriate to our patients. And particularly because this is in the pediatric setting that we are having parents involved with those conversations. So there are many applications a nurse has for this information. Thank you all very much for watching our presentation. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.